everybody, welcome back to Chris Travaganza. Today we watched Push from 2009. Not based on the novel Push by Sapphire. That was your one and only joke. Push was directed by Paul McGeegan, McGuigan, McGuigan, McGuigan. I don't know how to say his last name. He's Scottish and that's probably why. The other things that we knew of, or at least that I knew of, that he had also done were two episodes of Luke Cage, an episode of Scandal, and he directed Victor Frankenstein. Victor Frankenstein is one of the gayest movies I've ever seen. But that's neither here nor there. It has nothing to do with Chris. I have like spotty memories of watching Push before and did not recall most of the plot because it had just been that long. But it was a movie that I previously owned. And I've never seen it, so it had been so long since I'd even seen the trailer from its heyday, so yeah. I didn't even really know what it was about. Not that I ever knew back then. But it's about a young man named Nick, whom Chris plays, of course. Nick is telekinetic, and so he can like push and pull things, like items, around him. And he lives in a world in which people with abilities like his are being hunted by this government agency called The Division. The Division just wants this drug that was stolen from them that essentially just makes the powered people even more powerful. So Nick is busy like fighting The Division essentially because adorable Dakota Fanning comes in and tells him, hey I see the future, I need your help. They it's, don't know each other at all? Yeah, but... it's basically like where it starts off and along the way they meet a lot of people with a lot of different powers including Camilla Bell. They go back and forth about whether or not Nick and Kira, Camilla Bell's character, like have a history. It's kind of weird. Yeah. It's not explained we, too much. Well it is, but it's it's explained in a very non-linear fashion. It's like very quick. So yeah, so you have to like put the puzzle pieces together but they're coming at you very very quickly. Maybe that's not the best way to tell a story, but we will get to most if not all of that. Let's dive right into our pros. So the first pro is that it was made by Summit Entertainment, <laughs> which was important to Angel because they made the Twilight movies. So I have a lot of trust in them, so I knew it was gonna be something. There is narration in this movie done by Dakota Fanning and for once I don't think it was too much of an info dump. It was actually really useful information for the context of the movie. It started in 1945. The Nazis were conducting experiments in psychic warfare trying to turn those with psychic abilities into soldiers. I appreciated the narration because it set it up very simple and then we got right to the movie. And she mentions in this opening monologue that the division's agents are trained to track and hunt us down like animals, take us away from our families and friends. Because that's not super relevant in 2019. Jem and Hansu is in this. I have probably talked about Jaiman Hansu at least three other times on this channel and you probably haven't like caught it. I just like him. He's in Captain Marvel and he's in Guardians of the Galaxy and a lot of other movies. Chris wears Converse shoes in this. It's a good look. Speaking of good looks. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the sweater. Somebody in the costume department just said, let's put him in an oversized knit sweater that just clings to every crease in his body. That goes past your wrists. You know what's always sexy? Fingerless gloves. He looks dirty. He looks tired. He looks depressed and it's a good look for this movie. Dakota Fanning is just her own Definitely. pro. The camaraderie between oh. Dakota Fanning and Chris Evans is just... I know you're a second generation mover. Is that what the kids are calling it these days? From the get-go. That's us. And that's our money. And that's my toothbrush. So good. So endearing. For you. What is that? Lotus. I really truly cared about both of them and their relationship throughout the entire movie. It is the buddy cop comedy that we deserve. Somebody needs to get Chris Evans and Dakota Fanning in a movie together again. Could you imagine them like in a comedy together though? Like that would be so cute. Yeah. The writing and acting in this, with very few exceptions, mm -hmm. is really good. It's, it's like up to par with sunshine for me. The cast and the director and like the crew and stuff, they clearly were working in very close uh, consideration, I guess, of each other. The edginess of this movie works. It serves the story to be kind of gritty and edgy rather than other movies that are that way that, that we've named. talked about that, we, that shall not be named. There were some scenes that were just so quick and so jump cutty that it was like giving me 
whiplash and it was yeah. a lot coming at you but it makes sense given the context of this movie because it's a very intense movie like there's always a lot going on the stakes are really high yeah i think like the jump cuts maybe weren't always the best editing choice mm -hmm. but there were like certain cinematography techniques that really built up the tension and it was really well done. Yeah. I'm actually surprised. The music was kind of hit or miss in this it movie. It was. There were some choices that were very not congruent with the tone of the movie. Yeah. And then there were some choices, like there was this one like score throughout yeah. the movie that I felt really fit the tone really well. Dakota's recycling shirt slash her entire outfit was probably wow. the most like modern outfit and like obviously 2009 isn't that long ago but people are still rocking that today right and I don't think her look in general has ever kind of gone out of style like Camilla Bell's whole outfit like her entire costume at any point in the movie is no longer something that like most people wear unless you're like a very certain sort of person but not for Dakota Fanning was her hair uh pearl I don't know if I ever wrote it down but okay. we can we can count that as part of her outfit yeah because I think her hair was a pro like it was gorgeous it was like that perfect balance of like unkempt and like stylized wavy and I love like her pink streaks and yeah it just like really worked for her and like they discuss it too it isn't just like a thing that kind of like sets her apart Nick just picks on her for her yeah because yeah, he's like essentially her older brother lose a bet with your hairdresser and she's just like can you leave me alone I'm 13 let me do what I want yeah and like, she's 13 so it's like normal for a girl that age to be like rebellious about her hair and everything I wrote this down as a pro because we just couldn't figure out if we liked okay. it or not but like Camilla Kira's very mid-aughts outfit that she walks around for most of the movie in, which really felt like something a Disney Channel star would have worn on a red carpet at 100%. that point in time. I definitely wore those outfits growing up. So Kira is kidnapped by these two guys from the division, and she is able to create like alternate realities. She's she can into action whatever she's right. thinking. She puts like thoughts into people's head and makes those people believe that those thoughts are real. One of the, the fools from the division, Corstal, she convinces him that his partner killed his brother. Never had a brother, never lost a never brother. Happened. It never happened. She convinces him to kill his partner and then knocks out Corey Stoll and then takes the black coffee. She just sees the coffee and walks off with it. Sometimes you just need your coffee. Yeah. I'm surprised she didn't have enough adrenaline from like doing all that. She still also she was injected with the like the big man serum where she like is twice as powerful or something. Yeah. They're kind of vague about what this serum is yeah. supposed to do, but in any case. She she's like at the peak of it too. So she's hardcore. Oh, Cliff Curtis is in this too. He's in Sunshine. He was also Fire Lord Ozai in the Avatar movie that nobody talks about. I mentioned that and she screamed. I finally re like knew where I had seen him before. It was a big deal. And the fact that I immediately knew that he was in Sunshine made yeah. me really happy. My favorite pro of all is that Ming-Na Wen is in this. And she has a much bigger part than I thought they were gonna give her. They give her items and she sniffs it and she can like figure out who touched Whatever it last asking, and where they yeah. are. Like it's, it's like the history of the object. Like, kind of, yeah. It's, it's been. I'm surprised you had seen this before and never caught that. It's been so long since I had seen this that I completely <laughs> forgot. Jaiman Hansu tells Kira that she was at one point a division agent. She's injected with this super serum shit and dies but then comes back to life and that's why they're all after her because she's patient zero and she's the only person who could do that he's definitely manipulating her to get her to come back with him but we don't know that at that point all we know is that we think the kira has been playing nick the entire time and it's heartbreaking she tells nick later that remember that night under the roller coaster i remember never happened we met for the first time yesterday. So Nick wholeheartedly believes and has evidence as proof that he and Kira had a relationship. So then he would have like known that she was gonna be manipulated. Well, he knows and... that Carver does that. Anyway, moral of the story is the plot twists were really good. I was caught off guard. I'm still they processing it. They didn't really it. feel like cheap or anything. Is no. The thing. Like I was really, I really bought into them. Like it makes sense. Mm -hmm. This movie lines everything up. 
it's just not in a linear line. Mm. It's like it's like a squiggly line, and you have to like go and grab all the clues along the squiggly line. Kind of like this video. <laughs> Those were the end of the pros. However, we do have two things that are just kind of like on the fence. Camilla's bangs, classic 2009 bangs. Yeah. So I wrote down Nick cares so much as a middle of the road because it gets him in so much trouble. But also that trouble is completely fabricated and not at all real. It's just trouble that Carver really creates himself. But he just knows that Nick has the biggest heart in the world. I think I might legitimately be in love with Nick. Oh boy. <laughs> like, this is just what we need. <laughs> now we're gonna go into cons. Oh, we're switching, okay. I'm surprised we have so many cons. I think they're all legitimate cons, though. Okay. The first one is Chris's dad dies at the very beginning of the movie. It's I mean, really sad. not necessarily like a con to the plot, but it's just sad. Yeah, it's not like a bad thing that we yeah. didn't like. It just made me emotional. It's sad. Too many jump cuts during gambling scene. Yeah. The, and just kind of like throughout the movie, there general. are certain scenes that don't need that many jump cuts. That was the first one that got to us. Mm -hmm. Some of the powers are confusing. They don't really like give limitations to the powers. Camilla Bell mind melds an entire group of people in jumpsuits at the end of the movie, but like it was never really established that she could like control their entire body. Her power, as far as I could understand, is just that she can fabricate events by speaking them aloud. But he was murdered. And you know who did it, don't you? The bleeders. They're their, not- Their power's not like explained. I didn't need it to be explained. They just yell at such a high frequency that it bursts blood vessels. I didn't put it together until you said that. They're I mean, also they're called fish killers. Bleeders. The bleeders are fish killers. Yeah. I'm done with movies where fish are murdered. Body horror? The bleeders like oh. pop the blood vessels in his body, but they really can't gross. kill him because killing him changes the future in an adverse way to what they want the future to look like. Some weird lady called a stitch comes in and fixes him sort like of. Like a massage gone wrong. Yeah, and just like that alone. It just made me cringe. It's gross to look yeah. at. Yeah. Cassie doesn't believe in herself and we do. That little girl, she must be protected at all costs. It's after the scene with the bleeders where she's like, It's changed. I don't know why. Just something I did, mistake I made. And I was like, Cassie, you didn't do anything wrong. Cassie, like, I'm really disappointed that Nick didn't tell her that straight up. Yeah. That he was like, it's not your fault because it really wasn't Cassie's fault. <laughs> and she's always saying that the other watcher, seer person, is watcher. better than her. Yeah, I just because she's like older sad. and I guess has a little bit more But she's like always putting herself down. Yeah, and there's no reason for it either. No. Nick can't control his power. He like gets better at it throughout the movie, but they don't really ever talk about why he's not so good at controlling his power, except that he just doesn't seem to care at the very beginning. It seems kind of lazy, yeah. Kira and Nick don't talk before hooking up. They really honestly don't have a conversation about like how they know each other, how long they were together for, nothing. They don't kind of reconcile any kind of feelings about one another before they're hooking up. Really, they just make out and then Cassie comes back to the hotel room drunk. But also she manipulated his memory, his vision for him to come in there. I thought the bathroom was on fire. I had to get you to come in somehow. Then they just make out and he touches the butt and that's like <laughs> the scene. Carver's villain speech? Kara is our patient zero and with her we are going to create an army in the world's never seen before. I'm sorry, am I supposed to care? And I almost wanted to be like, I'm saying. Hey, Camilla Bell, which it's interesting because when I first saw this trailer in 2009, I didn't even know who Chris Evans was, and so what sold this for me was Camilla Bell and Dakota Fanning. And this was like the year that Camilla Bell was dating Joe Jonas, so it was a lot for me. She She's is not. She has like two notes to her personality. She speaks in a very monotone voice. We met for the first time yesterday. You've never been to Coney Island. She's the same in When a Stranger Calls, which is definitely more intense than this because it's like serial killer. It's the same like monotone acting and voice. Also, to be fair to Camilla, so that it doesn't seem like I'm just dragging her through the dirt for no reason. Yeah. There's not a lot for Kira to do in this movie other than just like be sick and, and sweaty and sleepy. <laughs> I was glad that like having watched this now that 
it was really more heavy on Chris and Dakota because that's not what I gathered from the previews, at least from what I remember. They did the work in the narration at the beginning to set up the movie so that they could focus on the characters, on the relationship especially between Cassie and Nick. What does the not division Chinese family want? <laughs> There's like this weird Chinese family with a watcher, two bleeders, and the dad very with the abusive. sunglasses. I don't know what his power is. They're just there through the whole movie. I think they want the serum that's in the case that they're all after, but I don't know what they want it for. I thought at one point that it only made sense if they were working with the division, but right. they're not. They make it clear at some point in the movie that they're not part of the division. I thought maybe it was just like a control thing. Like if they have this serum, then they can control the division to do whatever they want. I don't know. Yes. That's all I, I think gather the movie since... didn't really make that clear. No, it didn't. That's like the only part of the story that just doesn't make a lot of yeah. sense. Why didn't the Stitch just take the case? Oh my god. The Stitch that yeah. fixes Nick earlier in the movie comes back and like touches Nick and he goes back to being in pain and his blood vessels are all popped because I guess that's a thing a Stitch can do and then takes what she thinks is the actual case with the serum because she's working for the Chinese family. Why didn't she just take the case and leave if it was that easy? She just like waited for him to show yeah. up just so she could- She like waits in his dark bedroom yeah. just so that she can incapacitate him. And I know she doesn't know that she has the fake case but she has the fake case, so it was literally for nothing. And if he's not at home when she first gets there to take the case, why didn't she just take it? A lot happens, feels long, but it's still good. It's a little less than two hours. Maybe too much happened. Maybe. And I think there can be a case to be made to like take out some of the stuff that happens. I think especially with this third party Chinese family. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Be just because like otherwise like narratively they don't make a lot of sense since we don't really know what they want yeah kira is always sparkly at the very end like a big fight scene she shows up with division in a sparkly blazer and like short pencil skirt and then like some taller boots the outfit is not practical in any way the whole uh, the outfit as a whole isn't but especially the sparkly blazer your next point is so many suits that in opportune times. The bleeders from the Chinese family are suddenly wearing suits. They have never why. worn formal attire in this entire movie. You gotta dress up to scene. fight? I guess. Like, is that it just doesn't make any sense. The last con, and also very much related to the subject, is lip gloss at a time like this. Her lips are like frosted pink. You had time to do your makeup and wear the sparkly suit and you look like just you look a like you're trying to and uh, impress what? somebody. <coughs> Nick. We like genuinely liked this movie. Yeah, I'm surprised. Our arbitrary rank was Chris's character's hair, which was like pretty normal. Um, it's a good look. And I liked yeah. the facial hair he had going on. Scruffy and shaggy and it worked for look. him. The IMDb score was a 6.1. The Rotten Tomato score was a 4.2. Two four, which was lower than Loss of a Teardrop Diamond, and I'm just why on what planet? I like this more than Sunshine because the tone is more consistent than it is in Sunshine. It didn't turn into a horror movie. It didn't turn into a horror movie suddenly at the very end of the movie. You know what? I'm gonna give it an eight just because I liked it more than I like Sunshine, but I don't want to give it too high of a score and set a precedent because I know that this isn't the best movie that he's been in. It's just a really good one. What is your score? I was also gonna give it an eight. Okay. I'm only really like deducting points for the weird editing that kind of gave me a headache and the, the shiny clothes. The shiny clothes and the occasional not consistent song choice. The total point value for Push is 26.34. A lot of people felt disappointed by this movie and I don't really understand why other than possibly they were like comparing it to like um, X-Men. But I think that comparison isn't fair because it really isn't about the powers. It's really about the characters. They just happen to be powerful people. It's not like they're superheroes. They're just like normal people who yeah. have these abilities. Yeah, they're not, it, it's not like the X-Men as a team who are going out to save defend both humans and the X-Men and save the world, yeah. I mean, I've already mentioned that like I've seen this movie before. I don't remember if I ever saw it in theaters, but I have it 
clearly I have it on DVD. I've had this DVD probably as long as it's been out. <laughs> that was Push from 2009. The next movie is The Losers. I'm excited for that. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please click the bell below so you don't miss any of our future videos. Also, thumbs it up so that, you know, YouTube algorithm works in our favor for once. If you're not already subscribed to The Princess and the Scrivener, please do so down below as well, especially if you'd like to see more videos on Disney, intersectional feminism, pop culture critiques, and more, including Chris Travaganza, of course. We are so close to Scott Pilgrim, it, I can taste it. One of us will see you real soon.